Al Jazeera Podcasts. Touchdown. I repeat, EDL. FRC has touched down. A historic mission complete. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft delivered a capsule to Earth in September. It had traveled more than 6 billion kilometers through deep space to reach an asteroid that's older than Earth. The plucky probe took an extraordinary route until it reached the asteroid Bennu, which experts tell us is essentially a time capsule of the ancient solar system. OSIRIS-REx carried back roughly 250 grams of asteroid material. Problems opening the capsule caused months of delay, but last week, NASA finally got inside, and excitement is building for what could come next. This is the biggest carbon-rich asteroid sample ever returned to Earth. Scientists believe that this space dust could help answer their biggest questions about the early days of the solar system. So, what discoveries lie ahead about our planet's history and the future of space exploration. I'm Kevin Hurton, in from Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. We're talking to Al Jazeera news editor and resident space enthusiast Colin Baker, who's had the date of OSIRIS-REx's return circled on his calendar for a while. Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, these these are the types of missions that you circle on your calendar because I think that people will imagine that there are robots going to space all the time doing all sorts of interesting things. But actually, sending a probe into deep space to meet a tiny, dark body of rock barely the size of a building here on Earth and then return back to Earth with a piece of it is something that happens very rarely And though we have more of these missions in the future, we won't see them for many years. So it's actually quite a special event. Oh, very cool. Okay. In terms of an overview, maybe we could start at the very, very basic facts. The OSIRIS-REx project started seven years ago. And maybe you can just catch us up on what it is, what the mission is, and what's happened so far. Sure. OSIRIS-REx is a NASA project. NASA is the American Space Agency. And the goal was to reach uh, a tiny little bit of rock uh, in near-Earth orbit, which might seem uh, like it sounds close, but actually is still quite far away, to map that small asteroid. The asteroid was called Bennu. And then eventually to descend to its surface and then use a very special tool to basically reach into it, puff out a little bit of gas, grab all the dust and rock that sort of shot up from its surface, grab as much of it as it could in one scoop. And then it had to return to Earth and then drop this capsule. And now a whole new generation of work begins. And all of this material is going to be studied, not just now, but for years and for generations. Okay, so there's so much to talk about then. Why don't we talk about this asteroid that OSIRIS-REx landed on? It's called Bennu, as you said. It's about the size of the Empire State Building, which is not big in terms of space. And I do want to ask you about why they chose this particular asteroid. Yeah, there are millions of rocks out there in our solar system. These are all the remnants of the rocks that were here in our solar system before the sun ignited four and a half billion years ago the remainders of the stuff that didn't become planets. Hmm. And so when you look at the rocks that are sort of in vast orbits out there in the darkness of space, these are essentially time capsules. They are pristine little remnants of what was here before our planet was. Interesting sidebar, there are no known rocks in orbit that pose a life-threatening potential impact to Earth. But Bennu is one of them. Um, It has a 0.003, I think, chance of hitting the Earth in 150 years. It's still not nothing. It's still not zero. Exactly. It's not zero. And that means that it's actually the most threatening rock out there. So, Colin, maybe you can just give us some more detail on the incredible technological achievement that's required to just even hit this thing that is hurtling through space at such speeds. Like, how do you actually get a bullseye on that tiny 
asteroid? It's a really good question. You had to see it first. Bennu peered on telescopes not much longer than 20 years ago, but it seemed to look like it had the thing that scientists most want to know about, which is the carbon and even potentially the water of our early solar system. Carbon and water are two essential ingredients for life to exist, but scientists still don't fully know how they came to be on Earth, and thus, how life formed. And one of the ways that scientists can approach that question is to say, well, what are the materials necessary for life? And did they all come from here on Earth, or were some of them birthed in that cold darkness of space over long periods of time, and then were delivered here once Earth was stable? Colin points out that water, for example, has been found in many different parts of the solar system aside from Earth. In the craters on Mercury, closest to the sun, it's also in the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, far out, and we'll probably find it even farther. But only here has water contributed to life, despite the odds during Earth's youth. As far as we understand, the beginning of the Earth was very hot. Earth was a hot ball of molten rock, constantly being pummeled by rocks from space. It was not a very hospitable place for life, and certainly not for water. So the big question mark is, where did all the water come from? And prevailing theories are that uh, a lot of it was delivered by smashing comets, by smashing meteors, as a cooler, more stable Earth kept getting bombarded by material and made the oceans that we know of. But for Colin, the biggest scientific questions are centered not around water, but carbon. Carbon is the backbone for all of life as we know it on Earth. No matter how green, how furry, how small, how big, or how weird, all known life forms are based on the chemistry of one element, carbon. But why? Carbon but there are still gaps in our knowledge about how carbon contributed to life. Colin talked to a space scientist who said small samples of space dust can give us huge clues. One of the scientists who spent most of his career looking at those little tiny grains of dust is Zach Gainsforth. And he had a lot to say about this mysterious part of our own history that we actually don't know a lot about. We don't have that whole timeline, so we don't really understand our history yet. But it's actually really surprising how much you can learn from a tiny grain. In the case of stardust, which were comet samples, just from a single tiny grain, smaller than a human hair, we were able to set bounds on when Jupiter formed and to know about how much oxygen was present in the early solar system and the temperatures that were around. And that was just from one grain. And when you look at many grains, you start to see the variety of environments that existed in the early solar system. So bringing back a large sample like we are from Bennu, we will have those individual grains that tell a very detailed, but in some sense, a small part of the story. And then we can do that many times and start to fill out the larger terrain. I'm starting to get a sense of why this is such a big deal. For a scientist, this is a career-defining achievement. Just to be a part of this is just a, 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 a huge privilege. This just doesn't come along very much. And you spoke to some of these scientists who were there at that exact moment when it was opened up. Can you set the scene a little bit, what that moment was like for them? It's quite amazing, actually. Seven-year mission, and the capsule, which looks like a little UFO on a parachute, landed in almost exactly the spot in Utah at almost exactly the minute it was supposed to have been set years ago by their timeline. Wow. Unofficial touchdown time? 8.52 a.m.? A little bit ahead of schedule, too. <laughs> so the capsule flies in at ballistic speeds. SRC is experiencing maximum heating and maximum deceleration. So you just heard right there, we're experiencing that 5,000 degree Fahrenheit maximum heating and maximum deceleration that is at 32 G-force, punishing deceleration from Earth's atmosphere. Every scientist involved nearly has a heart attack because, of course, if it crashes, that's a lot of work lost. But it didn't smash. It landed gently on a parachute in the middle of a testing range, ironically. Kilo 2 has visual on the SRC. I repeat, SRC has been located. 
so once they recovered the capsule, they put it in a special box, bathed it with nitrogen so that it wouldn't react with anything on our planet. Because the worst thing would be if microbes from Earth were to change the sample that had been plucked pristinely from something that was older than the Earth, and then airlifted to Houston, to the Johnson Space Center, where it will live its life. And a few scientists who've been training for this for years stand in hazmat suits like you would see out of the movie E.T., in a room that was so loud they couldn't talk to each other, working by memorized motions in order to extract the samples from inside this capsule and dust off every bit of dust in order to preserve every single microgram of specimen from Bennu. And people breathed a sigh of relief for the first time in seven years, I imagine. Huge sigh of relief. There have been failures in the past. This was, this was a success. And all of this material is going to be studied, not just now, but for years and for generations. 75% of it is going to be locked away for scientists of the future using future tools. And it's going to yield all sorts of answers to some questions that we have now and some questions that scientists haven't even thought of yet about the origins of the solar system we live in, of the planet we live on, and then most importantly, of the water and the molecules that make life, that make Earth so wonderfully unique. After the break, we hear from the first scientists to see and hold what Osiris brought back from Bennu. So, Colin, you've been talking to a lot of scientists, and if people can detect the excitement in your voice, I think it's fair to say that these scientists are even more excited. Um, Can you just tell us why they're so excited and what specifically they're so excited about? There were a few scientists who were allowed to look at the samples as soon as the canister was open. One scientist I talked to, whose name is Pierre Hennecourt, he was amongst that early look team, and he received a tiny vial, about 100 milligrams of powder, to work with. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but for us, I could basically work my entire career with just the materials. Because he's looking at the types of clay-like materials that are sitting inside this asteroid, and that indicate, just by looking at them, that indicate that these rocks were in the contact with water at some point. They are everywhere in the sample. So it was very obvious as soon as we put the sample in an electron microscope, those fibrous looking clay minerals are literally everywhere. Now, that's exciting and interesting. Even longtime researchers have been overwhelmed by the excitement of what they might discover. Your hands are shaking. It's just like being back at grad school or something. That's Ashley King a British planetary scientist who was among the first to work on the asteroid's sample. When you first start handling meteorites, it's terrifying because you're very worried you're going to drop it and you're going to spill it and sneeze on it or whatever. And over the years, you kind of get a bit blasé about it and you get used to handling bits of meteorite and somebody gets, gives you a piece of Mars and you're like, yeah, that's fine. But this is completely different. Like having a sample that's just been collected by a spacecraft and brought back, how much time and money and effort has gone into that and then being asked to actually go over there and be present... Um, was completely different. So yeah, it's, it's, I mean, honestly, it's terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) And he basically is looking into the water that's locked inside some of these minerals. We might think that here on Earth, water comes in streams and oceans and rain. On asteroids, water is often locked inside other minerals. So the next step for us is to work out exactly how much water is locked up within these minerals, because that will give us an idea of how much water is on Bennu. And so therefore, we can start working out, you know, how much of this material do you need to deliver all the water that we see on Earth? So, Colin, as we wrap up, 
I do want to have a little bit of fun with you, so bear with me. So I'm not a scientist, but I do watch a lot of science fiction. So maybe I can just postulate a few things that would happen in the sci-fi version of this story, and you can tell me how realistic some of those scenarios are. I love it. Let's do it. Okay, so one, they open up this capsule and some sort of alien life or alien contagion is released on Earth and chaos ensues. We're in here. Now, I know this is far-fetched, but NASA must have at least considered something like this, right? It's very funny you ask this because there is a science writer named Corey Powell, and he wrote... Just to remind you all, this was the night before the thing landed, there is a zero chance (laughs) that this sample will contain any sort of substance that might contaminate or harm living beings on Earth who open it. Now, this, as you remember, is the this is the plot for the Andromeda Strain, the Michael Crichton book, which is one of my favorite (laughs) favorite books and favorite movies. What we're dealing with induces death within minutes. It's lethal. So I wanted to know, how can any scientist say that there's a 0% chance of anything? And he wrote back to me and he said, you're right, of course, strictly speaking, there's no such thing as zero risk. Aliens could have hidden a storehouse of deadly pathogens on an asteroid. (laughs) Or maybe it's not completely impossible that infectious microbes from ancient Earth were blasted into space, stayed on Bennu, and survived. But my point is that uh, empirically we have strong evidence that these objects do not present an infection risk nor is there any theory or evidence to suggest life could ever existed on these objects okay so the second scenario is that we flash forward from this moment of unbridled enthusiasm and discovery to a future where corporations start monetizing this the first trillionaire there will ever be is the person who exploits the natural resources on asteroids. So let me ask you, is the for-profit space mining industry inevitable? Yes, I think absolutely, if we make it to that stage in our human development. Asteroid mining is potentially extremely valuable. But actually, asteroid mining um, would be most useful to making stuff in space. The reason to mine asteroids, whether it's water from comets or, you know, iron or nickel from asteroids, would be to make the things that may allow us to live in our solar system or even take us beyond it. And yeah, you see that the biggest, one of the biggest corporations on Earth right now is a space company. It's SpaceX. Space has always been about these overlapping industries of defense, industry, economy, economic gain, and then at the edge is science, insofar as governments can afford to do the science. And they all feed each other in this ecosystem. So I don't think it's wild to think that the asteroid mining companies of the future will somewhere in their archive have the results from the OSIRIS-REx mission. Yeah. You know, Colin, one of the cool things about a story like this is because it expands time and it kind of shows us what a blip we are in the grand scheme of things. And I know that this mission is about looking back to the origins of the universe, but it has real implications for our future as well. And I want to key in on one thing that you said. You said that the material that's been brought back is designed to be examined by technology that doesn't even exist yet. What does this story make you think about when you look forward into the future of this type of discovery? I think it really speaks volumes that more of this sample will be stored for the future than will be studied right now. It means that there's more than enough to study in a very small amount today, and they will learn all sorts of fascinating things about our own origins. But by putting so much of it away for the future means that they anticipate that not just the tools, but the questions are yet to come about what what they're really looking for. And I hope that indicates that it has quite a long future and that science continues to be a very important plank of space exploration in the future, not just defense and not just private enterprise, but the joys of discovering new things using extremely complicated tools. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Miranda Lynn 
with Zaina Badr, Khalid Sultan, David Enders, Amy Walters, Chloe K. Lee, Sonia Bagat, Ashish Malhotra, Sari Al Khalili, Faranisa Kampana, and me, Kevin Hurton, in for Maliki Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is the Takes executive producer. And Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>